I'm Eric Shavey with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. Just want to welcome everyone today. Um, today we have uh, for our speaker is Dr. Timothy Davis, and Dr. Davis is going to speak on new invasive ants to know about. Um, he is with the University of Georgia Agriculture and Natural Resources. He is the Chatham County Extension Coordinator for uh, UGA Extension, and um, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to this. Dr. Davis, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. All right. Thank you. Let me real quick here see if I can get my screen shared like we did when we were practicing. When we were talking about this, you know, of course, this, this uh, program is something that we do with the uh, invasive ant species on, on e-extension. And most of the time we talk about fire ants because that was sort of our origin. And we decided we want to do something that talks about some of the other invasive species that are out there. And so I volunteered to do that because I spend a lot of time talking about fire ants and a lot less time talking about some of these other invasives. So I really wanted to do that. Uh, I did this talk one other time and I had a different title for it. Uh, my title was Ants About Which I Hate to Get Phone Calls uh, because usually we get these calls all the time. And, uh, you know, when it's one of these guys, it's something that I don't have simple answers for or may not even know a whole lot about them. Uh, so we won't talk a whole lot about management. We'll, I'll tell you what we do know about the management when we get there. But a lot of this is going to be identification. And the place where we really would like some help uh, as we do this is if you think you have these, uh, collect them and get them to your extension office so we can, we can keep a good track of where they are and if they really are there or not. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about a number of things. Uh, whenever I do talks, I, I kind of use this as my outline. This is the uh, elements of urban IPM. Uh, we normally talk about ins identification, inspection, prediction, evaluation, decision. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all those things and what they are, but I'm going to spend most of my time in identification. And the reality is that most of the time when we run into problems with, with insect management, or really pest management of any kind, uh, oftentimes people are doing the right thing, but they've misidentified what it is. and so. Uh, we need to make sure we have correct identifications. And that's, that's really kind of the key to unlocking what we want to do when it comes to uh, pest management is starting with that identification. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about decision, and that's the idea of what are we going to do about trying to manage these and whether we are or not. Uh, but that's not really going to be the focus today. Uh, why ants? You know, a lot of times I, you know, I do ants, my PhDs in ants. Everybody's all the time, you know, what's the big deal about ants? Well, there's a, there's a lot of big deals about ants. Number one is, on a worldwide basis, there's about 15,000 species of ants, different species of ants. In Florida, I think they've got about 215, 220 species. I've personally collected 125 species in, in South Carolina. I know a student who did some work just a couple of miles down the road from me at the Port of Savannah, and they had 40 species just at the, at the Port of Savannah. So, Lots of different variety there, huge economic impacts. Uh, we don't have to talk about fire ants and all those different things, but there's, you know, the impact of, of ants is, is, is something that uh, is really large and, and, and almost out of proportion. They are social insects, which makes them kind of unique and interesting. One of the things that I tell people all the time, if you want to get kind of a handle on how many ants there are, E.O. Wilson states in his book that uh, if you look at the biomass of humans and the biomass of ants, they're pretty similar uh, and, and come out to about 30% of the biomass. So if you took all the people and dried them up and weighed them, you took all the ants and dried them up and weighed them, that, that's about the same, same amount. And if you think about that, your ability to alter the, the environment around you, there's so many of them, they have to be able to make huge alterations to the environment. And so they play a very important role in that. Just a few things that they do. There's a lot longer list than this, but they, they do play a, at least a minor role in pollination. Uh, if you want peonies and, you, uh, and, you, and you're in, the, in a place where they grow, ants are important to that, that kind of thing. Seed dispersal. There's a number of ants that specialize in uh, certain types of plants, and those plants can't survive without that species of ant to, to disperse their seeds. Uh, they're very, very important as predators, scavengers, decomposers. And we all think that earthworms are important, but I'm going to tell you that ants move way more soil than earthworms and are responsible for lots more soil aeration than earthworms. So extraordinarily important group of, of critters to be thinking about. Ant identification. Uh, I always tell people, uh, Dan Wojcik was, was one of those uh, old guys. He's been retired for a while. And I, when I first started working with ants, I went down to visit 
visit Dan and we were asking him about identification keys and he just laughed at us and he said, if it was easy, vertebrate zoologists would be doing this. Uh, it is important because it really makes a difference on what choices we're going to make when it comes to management. And uh, in this particular slide right here, they all look like brown, red, nondescript ants, but there's actually five different species in this. Uh, you have some, a, a couple of species of, of a phenogaster here. You've got a chromatogaster there. You got a got a, uh, a fadoli there. And this is one of my favorite ones. That's a trachymeromix uh, septentrian alice. I, you can't I can't I can't miss a chance to say that word trachymeromix septentrian alice. There's no common name, uh, but they're kind of a, a native uh, leaf cutter that we find here in the southeast. Uh, so it's not always easy. And so what are we looking at when we talk about uh, ants? Oh, here's another one. I forgot about this slide. Uh, one of the things with ants is where you collect them is very important. And each of these species that you find are going to be someplace else in the environment. And so when we look at a place like this, um, you look at those bushes, you're going to have a certain type of types of ants that are found there, but they're not going to be found on the ground. Uh, they're not going to be found in that tree trunk. The ants that you find in that tree trunk are going to be different than you find Elsewhere, the ants up in the tree canopy, another different set, and 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 they don't. None of these overlap. That's how they keep from from fighting with each other. Is they is they partition themselves by this environment. Uh, if you look on this electrical wire, you'll have ants running up and down that electrical wire to get into the house and and move along there. Uh, there will be a different set of ants that you find up along the eaves. And if you look at those eaves, you know if you're doing treatment for ants and you treat. Uh, down here, because you think you have Argentine ants, but it's not Argentine ants, uh, th the fact that the ants are up here means your treatment really didn't do anything. So it's really important for your I identification on that. The, the ants that you find along the base are going to be different. Uh, the front yard's going to be full of fire ants and pyramid ants, and that's going to be actually different than what you find in the backyard so, uh, because it's shaded. So all those different ants live in those places. They learn to live together because they partition themselves oftentimes by, by ecological characteristics. And a lot of times the, the ecology out there is way more complex uh, than meets the human eye. When we look at ants, uh, they are insects because we have three body parts. We have a head, we have a thorax, we have an abdomen. Uh, the characteristics of, of ants to make sure that it's ants and not anything else is you have your thorax, you have your gaster, and in between we have what we call nodes or petioles. Uh, some ants are two humped ants and some ants are one humped ants, just like camels. And so one of the first things I'm gonna look at when I see, a, see an ant is does it have one hump or two humps? Um, the antennae on ants are elbowed. The technical term for that's geniculate. Uh, and frequently we have to count how many antennal segments there are. And, and fire ants, uh, we have 10 antennal segments. And then the last two segments, are clubbed. And so those are the kind of characters that we look at. The last character that we look at is down here at the tip of the abdomen. There's three characters we look for. Uh, we are looking for a stinger. So a lot of ants like fire ants or in this case uh, uh, um, pachycondyla or, or brachyponera I guess is the name now. Uh, Asian needle ant. We have a nice nice size stinger. Some of them don't have a stinger. They have what's called a cloacal slit. And it's just, just a slit there at the end of the abdomen. And then the third character, and this one's often really, really, really small, it's called an acidopore, and it's a little whirl of hairs around there, and there's a pore there, and they, they can shoot uh, chemicals or acid out of there. Uh, carpenter ants have this, and they'll grab a hold of you just like a fire ant does, and they'll turn around and they'll spray acid on you, and it can be, can be very irritating. So we're looking at those kind of characters to identify these things. And if you haven't been paying attention, that actually means you're probably not going to be able to do a lot of that with the naked eye. You're going to have to get some sort of magnification to do that. I mentioned about collecting ants for identification. This is something that can be really important. Uh, if you're dealing with a pest, we want to get a, get a positive ID, and that's one of the most important things that we can do when dealing with, with ant uh, problems. Uh, if you think you have any of these invasive we're going to talk about, again, we want to get those there. So I usually have some vials. Uh, for preservative, you can use uh, alcohol. You can use either ethyl alcohol, which is basically drinking alcohol. Uh, you can use isopropyl, which is rubbing alcohol. And lately, I've been using um, hand sanitizer because that's between 60 and 80 percent uh, ethyl alcohol. And it's kind of neat because as you put the ants in there, because it's gel-like, it, it kind of suspends them so they're not all stuck in the bottom. 
uh, and it makes it really good for displaying. Uh, I keep a, I keep my business cards with me, and when I when I collect something, I'll put them in the vials. Uh, I put put my name down there or whoever collected it, uh, contact information, uh, the location where you found it, the date that you found it, uh, anything you can tell us about the habitat where you found it. Was it under a rock? Was it under a log? Was it open? Was it was it forested? You know, anything you tell us like that, and any kind of damage that you're seeing or or behaviors. I write all that down. I put the vial and the card into a little plastic bag, and then I can come back even years later and identify those and actually go back to that site and look for them. I do, rec I do recommend using a, um, a pencil or an alcohol and waterproof pen. I love to have my forceps with me, and I'm going to tell you right now, those are forceps. Those are not tweezers. I've been married for uh, 27 years, almost 28 years, and uh, she still wants to borrow my tweezers, and I keep telling her those are not tweezers. Those are forceps. And she continually asks me what's the difference, and I tell her about 40 bucks. Uh, so you, you, those are my forceps that I use. And then hand magnification. I use these hand lenses. Uh, this small one here, I think is a 15X, and I think this is a 10X. And with a little experience, you can actually identify most ants using, those, using that uh, mag level of magnification. We are talking about non-native invasive ants, and so I need to define that. Uh, there's an executive order out there uh, that defines invasive species. Uh, it's one, a non-native or alien to the ecosystem in which is, con un which is under consideration, and two, whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So that, these are the kinds of ants that we're talking about today. Uh, the one thing I would add to that definition, if it were Tim Davis getting to write it however he wanted, I would add the concept of, of ecological damage, uh, because to me the, the economy and the environment are different things than, than just... Uh, and the ecology is the third thing. And so we see things where invasive ants come in, push out the native ants, and they disrupt the, the ecological relationships between plants and insects and animals and all those kinds of things. So uh, I, I actually personally like the idea of adding the term ecological in there. Uh, and I may tell a few stories about some of that as we go. Ants are dispersed in a lot of different ways, but these native or these non-native invasive species, mostly by human health. A lot of these, the first time we find these is at a port. Uh, I'm about two or three miles right now from the port of Savannah, and we found uh, tawny crazy ants, which we'll talk about at our port. M very frequently what you'll see is moving in nursery material. I had a, several species of ants that popped up on me in South Carolina. Shouldn't have been there, and then when we got tracing it back, somebody had bought plants from say South Florida and brought them up there and brought the ants with them. And so there are a lot of times there's heavy regulations on moving these materials uh, to, to try to quarantine and slow down the, the spread of invasive species, not just ants, but invasive species in general. So be aware too that as you move from one place to another, if you move um, in, uh, from one house to another house in another area, um, be aware that, you know, maybe taking those plants and those kinds of things, uh, you need to be, be a little more careful about it. If you're moving, particularly moving to a place from, say, where there's fire ants versus no fire ants. Nobody wants to take fire ants with you, so, so, so be thinking about that. Ant management, just real quick. Ants generally are not really hard to kill. Uh, there is no known resistance to any of the insecticides that we have out there. If you put that insecticide on that ant, it's almost certainly going to die. The hard part is reducing population. So if I go out there, and I use fire ants a lot as my example because I've spent a lot of time killing fire ants. You go out there and I use, use that, that white powder stuff and I sprinkle a bunch on there and I look out across my yard. I really think I've done a lot because I've got a bunch of white spots out in the yard. Uh, but I rarely, in that case, have I re really reduced the population because if I, if I treated 50 mounds out there, there might be 300 mounds total. And so I think I've done a lot, but I really haven't. So that, that business of reducing the ant population is, is the thing that is often very, very difficult. And the key to that and, and reducing that population is the ability to, to deliver the insecticide to the right place. And that's often where we trouble, have trouble. That's why we like, like baits a lot, because if they can pick that up and take it back to the rest of the colony, colony then I'm delivering that insecticide straight to uh, the whole colony. And that's how, how I'm going to treat the entire population. Uh, many of these ants, frankly, we just don't have good options, and we need some more research in order to get it. You know, ants, not all ants like all the same bait. Not all ants uh, are going to uh, 
uh, you're not going to spray the same places. And so uh, we're just really in a place where we really need more research for some of these ants that we're going to talk about. And that's why I hate getting calls about them because we just don't have the, the kind of answers that we have with fire ants where we've been working on fire ants for so many years and we've got some pretty good products from that. Ant biology is important. Uh, as I said, there's 15,000 species and every one of them is different. If you think about that, uh, humans and dogs are different species, right? We wouldn't expect to, to treat them the same way. And we're talking about the differences in some of these species being just as different uh, as humans to dogs or humans to fish. Uh, they're vertebrates. Uh, fish is a vertebrate. I'm a vertebrate. But what kills them and what kills me are two different things. Uh, one of the things we need to think about because they're social is we're not trying to kill individual ants. We're trying to kill colonies. And we need to think about the colonies like they're, like they're humans uh, or, or individuals. And each individual ant is like a cell within that, within that individual. And so our strategies need to be based around that. And understanding the biology is often really the key to successful management. And that's why ident identification is so important because once I know what it is, then that unlocks that key to the biology. There's things like colony budding. So you have a trail of ants and I spray that trail, I kill those ants, but all the ants that were to the left of what I treated form a new colony and all the ants to the right of what I treated form a colony. Um, that's called budding. And now instead of having one colony, I've got two colonies and that just made my problem worse. Uh, there's things like subcolonies. The, the reproductive queen, uh, carpenter ants are famous for this. The reproductive queen might be in, a, in the top of a tree 100 yards away, uh, but they had these subcolonies and the subcolony might be what's in your house. And I spray that colony in my house and I might kill those ants that are right there, but I really haven't in impacted the entire colony. Uh, I tell people it's sort of like you cut your finger off. It hurts, but it's not usually lethal. Um, mating flights uh, happen at different times. Uh, some, some species have flights, some species don't. It's one of the ways that, you know, you can, for fire ants, you can kill all the fire ants in the area, but I have a mating flight and they fly in from a couple miles away. Uh, so we need to understand that. Foraging activity, when do they forage? What are they foraging for? Uh, what's their food preference? These things change. Some ants like oils, some like proteins, some like sweets, and each of those things might change with the season. Each of those things might change with the time of day and the temperature, and so we need to understand that. And the life cycle. Um, sometimes uh, the colony is at, at the largest stage here, or most obvious stage, or a smaller stage, and, and knowing when it's doing that is, is oftentimes a key to, to good management. So let's talk about some of these species. This is the one everybody's been talking about lately, Nylandaria. Uh, there's a number of different species out there. The one that we're talking about um, most commonly here is the tawny crazy ant. The taxonomy on this one was all crazy. Nobody knew exactly what it was. There's a Caribbean crazy ant, which is fairly similar, almost identical. Uh, and, but the tawny is the one everybody's talking about. Sometimes you'll see it as the raspberry ant, and that is spelled correctly because it's named after Tom Raspberry, and it's not named after the fruit. Uh, these things are, are amazing. When you go out there, you look down and you stand for a second, and all of a sudden you realize the ground is moving. They're just huge numbers. And Fud Graham was telling me the first time he got a call about them, it was in Portomobile. He said, collect me a sample. Don't you just give me one ant. Give me a bunch of ants. And he got down there, and they had sprayed, and they actually gave him a five-gallon bucket of these ants. So huge numbers of these ants. And then – and uh, as you notice, too, uh, they are a one-note ant. Uh, they do have that acidopore, that whirl of hairs, and they're really, really hairy. Now, every time I say that thing about the ground is moving with ants, I get phone calls with people who say they have it, and almost every single time it's not this ant, it's this one. This is a native ant, uh, Dory Miramex. There's, uh, there's several species in Florida in South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, I've seen two species. Uh, to keep it simple, there's a red one and a black one. The black one can be in very large numbers. It's Dory Miramex medias is the one I think it is. Uh, they're a native ant. They're beneficial. In this picture that you see right here where I have circled all those dark spots, those are fire ants. Uh, and frequently when we see this, this Dory Miramex medias, we don't see fire ants. And these guys, they don't have a stinger and they don't have that acidopore. So they don't sting, they don't bite, they don't do anything other than kill lots of fire ants. So they're, they're pretty good guys. If you look at them up close, the two are pretty easy to tell apart. You've got this big hairy thing with these big long 
robust uh, spines on there or, or hairs on there. This one, the Dory Miramax, they're built for speed. They're fast and slick. They're kind of like a Lamborghini. Uh, beautiful ants. They're one of my favorites. Uh, and they have this little uh, spine-like projection on the middle of their back. And that's actually what they're named for. Their, their colony does is sort of, sort of like a pyramid, but the name really comes from this, this spine that's on the middle of their back. So take a little closer look. Uh, a lot of times, particularly along the coast, the calls I'm getting uh, are, the, are this native ant, not, not the uh, invasive species. This is the current uh, locations where we, where we know that we have uh, tawny crazy ants. Uh, a couple years ago, this, this one right here is about two miles from my office. That's in the Port of Savannah. Uh, I was talking to James Morgan uh, earlier this week. He was the first one to find these in, uh, inland a little bit. Up to that point, they had entirely been uh, along the Gulf Coast, and we kind of thought that's where they were going to stay. If you look at where this ant occurs elsewhere, it could probably cover the same kind of spaces that, that fire ants cover. Uh, we don't have really good controls for this one, but one thing we do know is that when we have these, pretty quickly they push the fire ants out. out. We are looking for good, good management. We don't have a good bait. They don't pick up fire ant bait very well, uh, and they don't seem to be very, very attracted to any of the liquid baits that are out there. Current management strategies, we look at moving, moving harborages and controlling moisture. Uh, when we do residual sprays, uh, if you don't remove those harborages, you do your residual spray, you move the, remove a, a piece of stick or a piece of siding or uh, a, a to kid's toy out there and you remove that. And then all of a sudden right there underneath, there's, there's tons of these ants. So they, they survive. We do know that when we do residual sprays, if we do larger areas, that seems to work a little better than when we do smaller areas. And that makes sense because if I treat a quarter acre, and not outside that, they can easily move back over top of that area from the outsides. And we don't really have anything that's very long term. Um, most of the time, you're going to be looking at uh, retreating in, in three to four months with these guys. Next one on my list. Dr. Davis, uh, if you yes, don't mind one minute, and I apologize to interrupt, but we have had a lot of chat and a lot of questions about. Sure folks video they're still stuck on the first slide uh-oh i'm so, on bracky mirror so, my... <laughs> yeah that's what i'm seeing uh tim why don't you just sort of reset things why don't you just stop sharing and then let's have okay. you share again and okay. for our attendees if you could chime in as soon as he reshares sure. yeah that, that stopped and then just go through that again How's that? So you should, I, I'm not even going to try to say that name. Dark, dark Rover Ant. Uh, dark for, Rover Ant. Yeah. Rocky Max Pat, Patagonicus. <laughs> yeah, for our attendees, that's what you should be seeing now. So hopefully let us know if you don't see. And if you don't mind, Tim, why don't you just move forward a slide? I'll move forward one slide just to see what happens here. And attendees, don't everybody chime in. If you don't see it change. You should have seen it change now. So it just changed. Got it fixed. Yeah. Okay. Changed. Okay, yes. Yeah, so I, th I think hopefully we're okay now. If you want, I can go back and show you the, the crazy ants. Um, I'll just show you those, those pictures real quick. Uh, this up here is the crazy ant. That's the, that's the tawny crazy ant. And this is that native ant that I was talking about. So just so you can get a kind of idea what, I, what I've been discussing. I apologize for that. When I'm talking, I can't, I can't follow the chat at all. All right, Brachymiramex patagonicus, or dark rover ants. Uh, a lot of times the entomologists will just say DRA. Uh, because we like TLAs, three-letter acronyms. This one is really, really, really small. Uh, I'm betting if Vicki is on the chat, she just said that these guys are really, really cute uh, because she, I know she likes them. Uh, and they are really, really small. Uh, they like sweets. And so you can see on this, this drop, that's probably a drop of sugar water, and it's trying to, it, it'll drink that and, and take that back. Uh, the key character on these guys is that they have a nine-segmented antennae. I know everybody gets out there and counts antennal segments, right? Um, but that's the key. We don't have anything else that has that. There are several species of these Brachymiramex, but the only one you're going to see uh, is, is this one. It's, uh, so if you count it, the big part here, that's the scape. That's, that's one. That actually counts. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine. Uh, so that's the key character with those. Uh, these guys, uh, oops, these guys, we're, we're getting more and more reports of them. Uh, throughout the southeast, we find these a lot of times, I see them a lot of times running up and down structures. I don't see them on the ground very often. Um, they do, we, we have some issues with treating them. I think most of the time we, we should be using some of the liquid uh, sweet baits and people are just wanting to spray them with, with some sort of uh, liquid insecticide. And so I think the, the liquid baits will do a little bit better job. Uh, I don't see these as terribly problematic most of the time. It, it's probably just their presence because they don't sting, they don't bite. Uh, when I do get complaints about them, it's because somebody sees an ant every two or three minutes. Uh, so they're not even there in huge numbers, um, but they can they can be. There's been some reports where they're a little bit larger numbers to worry about, um, but they're kind of a neat little ant, and we're probably going to be hearing more about this one down the road. I know they're doing a good bit of research at Clemson. Uh, Joe McCown's been keeping track of a lot of things uh, out of Mississippi State uh, where they're seeing them, and and so uh, that's one we're probably going to be hearing a little bit more about down the road. Um, Brachyponera uh, or Pachycondyla, I'll probably slip them and say Pachy or Pachycondyla because that's the way I learned it. That's Pachycondyla chinensis or Brachyponera chinensis. So I also get the common name mixed up. Uh, it's Asian needle ant is the correct name. I frequently slip and say Chinese needle ant. Uh, this one we're seeing out of North Carolina. We see it in South Carolina. I've picked it up here in Georgia. Uh, I think it's over in Alabama. Uh, and it's spreading pretty, pretty rapidly. It uh, can be in fairly large numbers. It, it can be out in the open, it can, uh, in disturbed areas, it can be in the woods. Uh, and this one has a whopper of a sting. It hurts like crazy. I got stung by one and uh, it burned for, for, for a good little while. Uh, and then it quit after about 15, 20 minutes like most insect stings. And then the next day it started in again. And that's one of the characteristics of this sting is the pain's there for a while and it goes away, and then it comes back. And um, it is a one-node ant. If you look at it, you have this one really large, robust node. And look at that stinger on there. That's a huge stinger. One of the things I know uh, I always think about with this one is the stinger is kind of shaped in this direction, where a lot of ant stings come down this way. There are a number of ants that look a lot like this one uh, that are native and probably not problematic. One of the easy ways to distinguish this one from those is this, this little area right here is real shiny. And on our native species, it, it continues to have the, the sculpturing on there, so it's not, not very shiny. I've gotten to a place where if I'm getting phone calls from the, from the Piedmont area, from a wooded area, uh, from the mountains, where somebody says they got stung by a bunch of black ants, uh, I used to automatically jump to the fact that that was probably fire ants, and now this one's uh, one I'm starting to jump to. It, it's not quite as aggressive as fire ants, but when it does start stinging, it, it actually hurts a good bit worse than fire ants. They're primarily like to eat termites. And so in some ways, you might think that they're pretty good in the environment, but they also eat other ants. And one, one of the things we're seeing is that when this ant appears, we don't see very many other of our native ant species. And when termites are in your home, that's a bad thing. But when termites are out in the woods, that's a good thing. So uh, these are these are one that we're concerned about. Um, there has been, I, I saw some research, I haven't tried to manage these ever before, but uh, I, I was reading in several places where they've had some level of success with, uh, with some of the fire ant baits. I know there's some who've tried uh, using some of the, the uh, granular insecticides like Top Choice. Uh, and it has not worked very well. And one of the reasons for that is if you miss a spot with the top choice, uh, you can have ants there. And so these guys like a complicated structure. They might be under a rock or behind some bark on a dead tree. And your fipronil just doesn't reach those areas. Uh, they also probably are, are foraging deeper in the soil. And so, again, they don't, they don't come in contact with the insecticide. So right now the main thing I think they're recommending for this are using some of the fire ant bait. And it does depend on your state. There are some states that interpret the label that if it says, doesn't say anything about that ant, you can use it. So in South Carolina, it doesn't say anything on the Andro can about, about Asian needle ants. So I can, therefore I can use it. In some states like Texas, unless it says that you can, you can't. So when you go to that can of Andro in Texas and it doesn't list 
uh, brachyponera, you wouldn't be able to treat for it using that insecticide. So check with your state laws um, before you, you, you treat for some of these ants because they may or may not be on the labels. Wasmania, uh, this, this one has got a couple of uh, common names. The most frequent one that you'll see is little fire ants. They're not really fire ants. Uh, in Australia, they're starting to call them electric ants. And the reason for that is they also have fire ants invasive. And there was a lot of confusion between the invasive fire ant and the invasive little fire ant. And so they've, they started using the, the, the name electric fire ant. These guys are really, really, really small uh, and kind of yellow in nature. Um, if you're looking at identification characteristics, they do have 10 segmented antenna. They do have a two segmented club. If you've heard us talk about fire ants, uh, those are characteristics of a fire ant, and that's probably where the term came from. One thing fire ants don't have are these nice uh, spines on the thorax. So when you, when you see that. Another characteristic of these, a lot of people point out with these that uh, they move really, really slow. So they, they, they're almost lazy is the term that, that you hear people use. So when you see them in the environment, that's what we see. This is a fire ant on top. That's a tropical fire ant. That's actually the native to southeast. Uh, U.S., but it's become problematic uh, across the uh, across the globe elsewhere. This is a little fire ant, and this these are not inches; these are these are millimeters. So you're talking about an ant that's one millimeter. Oops, let's go back. Accidentally clicked there. A lot of times you see these clumped together. Most common place that I've run into them is on the underside of leaves, where they they are in pretty large numbers. They're not very aggressive; they won't bother you. But once they decide they're going to bother you, they do so in large numbers. Um, my first encounter with these was fairly classic. I was in South America. I was collecting some insects for a project that we were working on, and I walked under uh, a tree, and I brushed the limb. Didn't think anything about it. We do that stuff all the time when we're walking around out there, and all of a sudden, the back of my neck started burning, and these had dropped down between my shirt and my collar. And that's a real classic thing they talk about is them dropping out of the trees. A lot of times you hear about they bump the trees and they kind of like come down with rain. Uh, these guys are problematic in the U.S. Uh, in southern and central Florida. They're having a real time with them in Hawaii. And worldwide, these are a problem in uh, most of the Pacific Rim. Uh, Taiwan is, is seeing them, I think. Uh, we know they're in Australia. Uh, most of the Polynesian islands uh, in the Pacific have them. Galapagos has them where they're affecting the tortoises. So these, these guys are pretty problematic. They uh, control with these uh, using fire ant baits work fairly well. As I pointed out, they're a lot of times up in the trees, so they don't come in contact with those fire ant baits. And so uh, one of our researchers in Hawaii, we we're, were talking and made the comment, well, why don't we get some sort of sticky bait that we can shoot up into the trees and six to the trees and uh, I, I suggested to him that he try the, the stuff for, they use for popcorn ceilings to, to make it stick or use the applicator. And he actually developed a, a whole treatment system using, use it, where he can go in under the trees and spray like a popcorn ceiling type of, of thing on there uh, to, to apply his bait uh, where, the fire, where the little fire ants are. They are looking for you to report those. So if you're in Hawaii and you uh, think you have little fire ants, there is a whole website there that, that they have for you to be able to report those so they can map them. Uh, so far, they've been in they've been in South and Central Florida for oh a good 20 years or more, and they seem to have stayed there, and and kind of hope they stay there. Um, but uh, worldwide, they are these are these are a huge problem. Myrmica rubra. Uh, we were talking about this one before the, with the with the panels beforehand. This is one I've had no personal experience with. This one is uh, we're finding this one up in New England. I think the first re reports were in Massachusetts and it spread uh, kind of north and east from there. It's, it's found in Maine, uh, even across into Canada, into uh, Newfoundland and, and New Brunswick. Uh, it's a fairly good sized ant. Uh, unfortunately, I really hate the fact that it's also called a fire ant because it's also not a, uh, one of our fire ants, I suppose. Um, but it is, a, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's called that and it, it comes from Europe. I put the picture of the butterfly there because this one has a really neat little thing that goes on in Europe. We don't have this happening here, but it, but it happens in Europe. There's a, a, the Maculinia butterflies are social parasites of this ant. So the butterfly lays an egg, and the ants are out there walking along, and they say, oh, look, somebody left a baby. And they take that back to their colony, 
and raise it as their own, not realizing that it's not an ant baby, but that it is a caterpillar. And as the caterpillar hatches and grows, they continue to feed it, and it eats their babies, and it eats their eggs, and hatches into these butterflies, um, most of which are threatened, um, but are also indicators of high quality, uh, healthy um, areas of, of, of grasses and, and savannas and turf. Uh, in the turf. So uh, they're an indicator species for that and they can't survive without this ant. So uh, it's just kind of a neat little thing that just popped up and a lot of times when you do these talks you learn things you didn't know and that's that's one of the things I learned I didn't know about this ant. Uh, they do have a very strong sting. We have some native species of myrmic and I've been stung by those. Uh, don't ask me how but but it's true I got stung by some and, the, and it is a pretty painful sting. In, in New England, uh, where these are occurring, they are occurring in pretty large numbers. Uh, and, they're, and they're creating similar problems to what we see with fire ants, with, particularly with their stings. The last group I'm gonna talk about are the big-headed ants. Uh, from that photograph, you probably can't tell why they're called big-headed ants. Uh, they're what they call, we call dimorphic. We have major workers, and they do have these big heads. Uh, and then they have minor workers, which are, which are much smaller. This is one of the largest taxonomic groups of all ants. Uh, there's, there's several hundred of these uh, species worldwide and probably one of the most prolific. The two that we're gonna talk about today is Phidoli megacephala. Uh, uh, Phidoli me megacephala or big headed ant, uh, they're, they're actually on the label for several, several things. Big problem in Hawaii, in fact, it's a predominant ant that you'll find in Hawaii is, is Phidoli megacephala. Um, we do see these in South and Central Florida and a, uh, a worldwide problem again on the Pacific Rim. Uh, they can be treated using a lot of the fire ant baits and some residuals. If you get a little closer up look of these, they have a 12 segmented antenna. And these look, by the way, a lot like some of the fire ants out there. And it's, it's pretty easy to confuse them. But if you look up close, you got 12 segmented antenna instead of a 10 segmented antenna. You have a three-segmented club instead of a two-segmented club. I know everybody does that, right? As soon as you pick up an ant, first thing you do is count the antennal segments and how many how many segments of the club. Yeah, okay. Uh, the other characteristic about these that are different from fire ants is they do have these spines on the back, whereas fire ants are smooth. Um, the second species that we're starting to see, and is, this one's actually spreading pretty rapidly, is Phidoli uh, obscura th thorax. I don't know if there's a common name for that. We're again seeing this one along the, the Gulf Coast, uh, and it seems to be spreading uh, inland a little bit more. And this is one that we're also concerned about. Again, th this is one that when they're there, they're there in fairly large numbers, and they tend to push out some of the other ant species that are there. Uh, this one's actually not too difficult to control with some of the fire ant baits. And most of the fire ant baits do have big headed ants on the label, so uh, that's a good thing that, that's there. With that, I'm, I'm going to give us some time. There are a number of online resources. Uh, I really like the, the entomology uh, and nematology department from, from the University of Florida. They have a web uh, page called Creature Features. They do a really good job of putting together fact sheets on all of these. A lot of the pictures that you saw today came from those fact sheets. Um, the e-extension website, of course, is one that we, we have. We recently switched from a, from a fire ant community of practice to a um, invasive pest species community of practice and so we're, we're developing fact sheets on each of these pests and bringing in experts on each of these ant pests so that's a good source antweb.org ant wiki uh, all have good uh, really good photographs a number of the photographs I got from, from those sites uh, and the Mississippi Entomological Museum uh, also has very good uh, photographs and he, one of the things uh, Things that they've done there is they've compiled all the ant identification keys into one place. So instead of doing like I had to do, where you go to the library and copy and make, you know, a stack that's probably three feet tall, you can do that all in one place. So lots and tons of e resources. I I'm assuming that in the chat a lot of these have already come up because I did send them to one of our one of our moderators. With that, if there's any questions that you would like to ask, uh, I've got about. 19 minutes left by my clock uh, to where we could ask, where you can ask me some questions. Hey there, we, are you ready for a couple of questions? Because we, we do have a few. Okay, and go so, ahead. 
here we go with one it says could the spread of these and he is talking about the the last ant you were talking about be associated with the spreading of invasive plants i don't know that there would be a correlation between invasive plants and in, and these invasive ants or any of these species other than the fact that frequently we move plants from one place to another and in doing that we often move the ants the other thing that happens is interestingly enough Invasive species a lot of times have the same mechanisms for moving. So a lot of times if you have uh, two invasive species that may be, one may be a plant, one may be an ant, and they co-occur, they may spread at the same rate over the same places. But it's, it's one of those, there's a correlation, but there's probably not a cause necessarily where one is helping the other, if that makes sense. And this is one from Margaret Allen. She asks, what do you call an introduced species that does no damage? You would call that an alien species or a non-native species. Uh, and, and we do have a number of those. In fact, we have a lot of those that are out there that, that you know, we plant, we think they're great, or, or they're out there and they don't do anything. Some of these ants that I, I went to uh, show today, we used to think they were in that category. And they sat there and they didn't do anything, they didn't move. A good example of that is, is the, the Asian needle ant. Uh, it was kind of in one place, didn't do much, and you know, it was kind of there for 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden, boom, it exploded. Uh, when I first started studying, uh, working with ants in the late 90s, uh, it was confined to a few places in North Carolina, and it kind of stayed there, and over the last uh, seven or eight years, it's, it's just spread all over the, uh, the southeast. So just because it doesn't spread right away doesn't mean it's going to stay that way and that's one of the things with invasiveness we've had a very hard time predicting what's invasive or what's going to become invasive versus what's not what else thank you and you you were just talking about the is it pronounced fidoli fidoli yeah fidoli okay and then it showed that when you showed the screen of that it had it coming in through Mobile and traveling north through Alabama? Correct. So with upcoming storms, like the one that's predicted to come in over the weekend where winds will be, what, what not, 60 or 70 miles per hour, will that have something to do with the spread? Storms, are, when, storms can be used by species to spread from one place to another. Um, even things like ants that are relatively what we would call sessile or in one place uh, because it can pick them up and move them. But that's usually kind of limited by, by comparison to what human uh, aided movement is. Uh, if you look at the map that we used to have or still have of the spread of fire ants, you know, it stayed in the same place, 1930s, 1940s, 1950, not really much spread. In fact, E.O. Wilson's dissertation was on that, and he predicted five miles per year. Well, all of a sudden, 55, a, a huge spread. Uh, 60, even bigger. And so what happened was, that's when we built our highways, and it became profitable to do things like grow sod and mobile and ship it to Charleston, South Carolina. You, you know, before that, you couldn't afford to do that. Now you can. And that's when we start seeing those, those spread uh, much more. I, I'm less, I'm much less concerned about natural spread than I am about uh, human aided spread of these invasives. Thank you guys. We're still taking questions. If you want to ask one either in the, the chat box or the question and answer box and Mark, is it okay if we put up those survey questions while we see if anyone. Yeah, it absolutely is. Out? Yeah. I'll go ahead and launch that poll now folks. So if you'll enter your. Uh, enter your responses while we're taking questions. This is probably the first time that I finished anything close to on time or early. So you should take this chance if you have any other questions you'd like to ask. And I'll point out too that next next week or next month, uh, my friend Dr. Eric Benson is going to be talking about pantry pests and clothes moths and some of those uh, those kinds of pests. Any more questions? I see a couple of attendees with a with a hand raised, but if you would like to, I can't. 
I don't know how to get to you, but if you have a question, please do type it out. And we, we may have just had a couple come in. I do see one that says, is climate change in influencing uh, or changing the antscapes? Uh, yes, there is a lot of prediction that as temperatures rise, for example, uh, a lot of these native ants are probably going to be restricted by temperature and moisture. And as climate changes and we see uh, more it, warmer further north or more moisture coming in, uh, there should be an opportunity for those invasive ants to spread uh, and move further further uh, outside the current areas where we would predict, predict them to be? That's a very good question. I think sometimes we don't really know how much that it's going to impact it, but it certainly is going to. Okay, here is one from Sherry. It says, can ants swim? What about the impact of yeah. recent hurricanes? Well, whenever we get floods and hurricanes, uh, those of us who do fire ants get flooded with calls about ants because a lot of these ants do come from places like South America uh, and or the Pantanal region of South America and then it's a flood, their, their natural habitat is a flood zone. And so they do have the ability to, to not necessarily swim, but they float up, uh, they join together and they use surface tension uh, to float on top and they, 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 the physics of how they do all this, but basically they're, they're just floating and, and hanging together. Uh, and they do that a lot during the floods. Now, if, if it floods really, really fast and the water's moving really, really fast, they have problems. Um, but they do, they do form these rafts. And I, I tell people all the time, if you see those, don't touch them because the first thing they do as soon as you touch it is they, they crawl up whatever it is. And we actually use this behavior in research. We'll, if we want to separate ants from the soil, we'll, we'll put a, dig up the whole colony in the soil and put it in a bucket and we drip water in there really slowly. As the water comes up, the ants raft up, and then you can just scoop them up with a spoon or a spatula and put them in a place. And, and we use that very regularly um, and have used it for a long time. So, yeah, a lot of ants, they're, you're, yeah, certainly some are going to drown in a flood, but they, they have ways of getting, getting around it. Tim, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to ask a question. I, I grew up in eastern North Carolina, sandy loam soil there. I'm in western North Carolina in the mountains now. Uh, of course, grew up with fire ants in the eastern part of the state. However, they're not here in the mountains. Why? Is, is it the soil quality and the clay here in the mountains? Is that the reason they're, they're not here? The biggest reason, is, uh, the biggest things that restrict the spread of fire ants is going to be temperature and moisture. Okay. Uh, and cooler so if, here in the mountains. If you get cooler in the mountains, the spread has been slower. Mm -hmm. uh, although in South Carolina, we're seeing them starting to show up there. And I know some places like uh, I've been up in, in and around Asheville mm -hmm. and seen them. And a lot of that, um, in fact, one place I saw them, they weren't in the rest of the, the area. They were only in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, a, it was a camp. So I'm certain that what was happening was buses were coming from places where there were fire ants and parking there. The fire ants were dropping into the parking lot. And that was uh, five or six years ago. And the camp um, director called me recently because now they have fire ants down in their soccer field and things like that. So um, that's, I wouldn't say that in mountains of North and South Carolina, they can't be there, but the, the temperatures have slowed it down. When we see them in Tennessee, it's usually in the low areas, not up in the mountains. Uh, another difference too, is that in the mountains um, on the Western North Carolina, you have a lot of trees. And so when we get about 60% canopy cover, uh, some of these ants are not very happy. And so I think that slows it down. So when you do find them up there, it's a lot of times along the roads or parking lot where you have, an, have a little bit of open disturbed area. Okay, great. Any reports of fire ants in eastern yeah. Kansas? Uh, it's a good thing and a bad thing, but I think Kansas is probably too cold to support a, a fire ant population. You might occasionally get some during the summer when somebody brought something in there, but they will almost certainly never survive uh, a winter in Kansas. They do get up into Oklahoma and they kind of do a yo-yo thing in some of those states like Oklahoma where it builds up and you have mild winters and it goes further and further north. And then all of a sudden it'll, it'll, it'll get a cold winter and they kind of pop back down. We see the same kind of thing in Arkansas, but I don't know of any fire ant uh, populations that, are, that have established in, in Kansas. Good questions. And there is one from Piedmont. Uh, we get reports in the Piedmont 
of large numbers of ants that are displacing fire ants. They are also reported to sting, no visible nest. Unfortunately, a sample has not been collected. Ideas? Yeah, my first idea is the one I always do, and this is why they hate me on radio and TV for call-ins, because the answer is I gotta, I'm gonna need a sample before I make a guess on that. Uh, there, it, it could be, you know, the, the Chinese needle ant or something like that, but really I'd want to see that, uh, get my hands on it. You can collect them. You can take them to your local county extension office. If they cannot identify it in your office, uh, which is possible, they can send them to a university, um, department and somebody there can identify them. But the key to that is I'm not going to guess, uh, when people tell me a dark ant, all you did was eliminate the light colored ones uh, from those descriptions. So uh, collect them, get them in some alcohol, get them to your county extension office, let your extension office try to get them to an expert and we'll get them identified and see what we work out from there. Also just to plug for uh, uh, ask.extension.org, you know, you can submit a, a picture there. The, that application is mobile ready. So if you can take a, you know, of course you want a, a good, uh, you can submit up to three pictures there. So get as high quality of, of pictures you can but uh, that, that that's another option for trying to idea pest and a lot of times we can identify them from a photograph um, but remember we're a lot of times we're looking at how many nodes do they have between that abdomen and not and so you, a lot of our cameras don't do that how many antennal segments a lot of times i can guess based on you know some other characteristics and i look at a lot of them uh so i, I can make some guesses and kind of fill in the blanks that, that are there but the more detail you can get on those photographs, the better the better it is. Um, and then barring that, it's gonna require a physical sample for us to look at. But yeah, I get, I get all kinds of ask the expert questions uh, with photographs. Uh, we answer the ones we can and then we pass around the, the, the funky photographs and say, can you believe they tried to make me identify this one? <laughs> Listen, I, I try, I'm one of those guys who assigns them to you and I, I try and be as kind as I can to yeah. read it. <laughs> To try and weed it, try and weed out the ones that I know there's no there's no way you can identify. Okay, question. There's a question up here that just popped up about a recommendation for a microscope camera. Um, that's a big topic, and you could go, you, you could spend tens of thousands if you want to, but a lot of times you can take one of those hand lenses and your camera phone and use those in combination to get a pretty decent close up. Uh, there's also some fairly inexpensive clip-ons that you can buy that will clip on your phone and has a basically a magnifying glass on that that you can use in your phone. And you'd be surprised at how good those turn out. Uh, I Vicky and I are constantly sending pictures back and forth and kind of like can't believe we got a picture like this uh, on our phone. And I got a great one uh, last week with a, with a spider that had caught a, a, a yellow jacket. So, um, my recommendation is the best best picture you got is the camera that, or best camera you've got is the one that's with you. And if you can buy these little clip ons and they're, you know, anywhere from 10 to $60 and I haven't found the $60 ones to be any better than the $10 ones really. Uh, so there, it's a, it's a pretty decent option. Yeah. I'm going to put a link in chat. Uh, we did a webinar with uh, Dana Wolf, I, I think, or uh, I think I'm getting her first name wrong. It's not Dana. Maybe Danae. Anyway, she did a, uh, this webinar, again, if you click on it in chat there, and there's a link to the recording, macro photography on a budget, and she does some great uh, pictures. Uh, she does insects and things. Some of you may know her work. Uh, she does some excellent work, but she covers, in this webinar, she talks about some of these clip-on devices and other sort of uh, budget-type cheap things, you know, less than a, a hundred bucks. To, to do some pretty uh, impressive things. So it's it's actually pretty impressive what you can do. Yeah, it is. Um, is ant species extinction a problem? Um, they are very resilient. And one of the things when it comes to uh, invertebrates is nobody cares for the most part. And ants is one that nobody cares about. So there's not a lot of research being done on what is the impact of Invasives on this ant population, is it becoming endangered? Uh, in fact, I don't know of any ants that are listed as endangered or threatened. And my suspicion is that's because we don't look at that, not necessarily because it is or, or is not happening. Um, I strongly suspect that as we bring in a lot of these, these non-native invasive species that they are impacting, well, we know they're impacting 
ant populations, but the question is, is it in, impacting them the level of extinction, extinction? And the answer is, I don't know. So uh, thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, it was great information. Um, I will start looking at ants more closely now. Um, I have, I have a uh, microscope in my office that's covered up with a bunch of boxes, so I'm going to have to get it out and make sure the camera works. But uh, thank you again. Um, you'd already mentioned next month, November 3rd, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, Dr. Eric Benson, uh, Closed Miles Pantry Pest. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your input, uh, for your questions. And Dr. Davis, again, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.